Hi. You know me as Darren Corbin because that is my name. And you are watching Wrestling with Regret. Well, folks, WrestleMania is just around the corner, and with it comes all those annual traditions. The bright lights, the pageantry, the endless complaint that your guy didn't win or didn't win big enough because it's our lot in life as wrestling fans to be miserable all the time. Then, of course, there's the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, which will go into its sixth year this April in New Jersey. Now, battle royals at WrestleMania are nothing new. They go back as far as Mania 2, when, in the semi-main event of the Chicago portion, Andre the Giant won a 20-man bout that featured the stars of the World Wrestling Federation and the National Football League, including Russ Francis, Ernie Holmes, William the Refrigerator Perry, and Bill Fralick, who would actually make a return to the company several years later when trying to body slam Yokozuna on board the USS Intrepid. Fralick did more in the Federation than Perry, and he once dated Missy Hyatt, yet the Fridge is the one in the Hall of Fame. Typical. Anyway, the Battle Royal has been a great way to get as many wrestlers involved in the show as possible. Since 2014, the match officially became an annual fixture on the show after being named for the legendary big man who won his fair share of Battle Royals. But the match has been full of controversy over the years and is often met with groans by hardcore fans for failing to live up to the hype. And this year, things feel pretty much the same. This week we look at the brief history of the Andre Battle Royal, also known on the interwebs as the Armbar. We'll examine the winners of said Battle Royal these last five years, where their careers were before and after their victories, and we'll try and answer the question, is this Battle Royal cursed? Settle in folks, because things are probably going to get depressing. As the build to WrestleMania 30 intensified, host Hulk Hogan revealed on an episode of Raw the first ever match in Andre's name would take place at the Superdome, or the Silver Dome, depending on when you asked him. Right away, fans had high expectations for this match. Not only was it named for one of the biggest legends in all of wrestling, but it was endorsed by the Hulkster himself. He even takes credit for coming up with the match in this promo. I came up with a historic idea. We're going to have an over-the-top 30-man Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, brother. Combine that with a big old trophy in Andre's likeness, though not quite as big as the one Bad News Brown won at WrestleMania 4, and this match had the potential to make a huge star in the winner. In a real moment of irony, Yoshi Tatsu, the winner of the previous non-Andre Battle Royal, was the first man eliminated here. The final two came down to the big show, Andre's former fake son, and Cesaro, the future Thwith Thyborg. In a tribute to that iconic moment at WrestleMania 3, Cesaro showed off his freakish strength by picking up show and body slamming him over the top rope to win the match. It felt like the perfect moment. Cesaro had just broken up with his tag partner Jack Swagger earlier in the night, the momentum was on his side, and he won the inaugural match in a memorable way. It got one of the biggest reactions of the night. The next night on Raw, he was personally congratulated by Hogan. He even traded in Zeb Coulter for Paul Heyman as his manager. Surely this meant great things for the Swiss Superman. Nope. It turns out that Paul Heyman's Golden Touch doesn't have a 100% success rate, as the partnership between he and Cesaro went nowhere before the two were split up a couple of months later. Cesaro gets paired with me, to be blunt, as an excuse for me to be on television and remind everybody that Brock Lesnar beat the streak. It relegated him to being a supporting player for a guy doing a promo about something else. Antonio would be eliminated from an Intercontinental title tournament, failed to win the US Championship, and went 0 for 5 against Dolph Ziggler for the IC Championship. The final dagger appeared to be plunged into his chest on the Stone Cold podcast that featured special guest Vincent Mann. Aside from tap dancing around the CM Punk situation, one of the biggest takeaways from this interview was Vince having the great Bruce to say that Cesaro was to blame for his lack of push simply by virtue of where he was born. I mean, he doesn't quite have the charisma, he doesn't have quite the uh verbal skills as well. It may be because he's Swiss, I don't know, in terms of the European style. But at the moment, and hopefully you'll get it, he lacks it. Now on one hand, I can kind of see where Vince is coming from here. If you have a wrestler who's being endorsed by Hulk Hogan, Paul Heyman, and presumably the ghost of Andre the Giant, and he still fails to get over, you could argue it's at least partly the wrestler's fault. But need I remind you, wrestling is a work, and that Cesaro wasn't booking himself to lose? Somebody with a pencil could have easily turned things around for him. 
For many fans, it was one of the most confusing and frustrating things about 2014. They obviously wanted Cesaro to succeed. The reaction to him winning in New Orleans was proof enough of that. But not only did they cut him off at the knees by having him constantly lose matches, they kept him from using the swing, one of the most over moves in the company at that time. I mean, come on, Cesaro, why aren't you grabbing that brass ring when we make you look terrible and take away all the things that made you cool? Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Cesaro finally managed to correct his tailspin by the end of 2014 by forming a tag team with fellow mid-card wanderer Tyson Kidd. By next year's WrestleMania in Santa Clara, the two were the tag team champions and defended the belt on the kickoff show. Not a bad way to end the day, but after that great moment at the Superdome, it feels like a huge drop-off from what could have been. Speaking of WrestleMania 31, the second ever Andre the Giant Battle Royal was demoted to the pre-show instead of being on the main card like it was at Mania 30. Yep, this match is clearly not already an afterthought. In the end, the previous year's runner-up Big Show finally made his kayfabe daddy proud by eliminating Damian Mizdow to win the trophy. This made him the second biggest heel of the weekend, right behind the man responsible for ending the wildly popular Mizdow storyline in one of the lamest ways possible. After WrestleMania, Show immediately moved on to a short feud with Roman Reigns in what I suppose was an attempt to build Roman back up after his disastrous reception at Levi Stadium. Show would lose the feud at Extreme Rules and took a month off TV. He has since spent the last few years making sporadic appearances, along with plenty of inexplicable face and heel turns along the way. His most recent runs have included dropping a ton of weight, teasing a match with Shaquille O'Neal for the hundredth time and never pulling the trigger, feuding with big cast to defend poor Enzo Amore, passing the torch to Braun Strowman only to have creative blow it out, and being Cesaro and Sheamus' heavy for all three weeks. While the Big Show win of the Battle Royal made sense, you could argue it was wholly unnecessary. The fact is, the Big Show never needed a win like this. He was already one of the most famous big men of the sport, so it's not like he needed further validation or legitimacy. That being said, it was fitting to have a giant win a match that was named in honor of another giant. In 2016, the Battle Royal made its way back onto the main card, and boy, it came back with a vengeance. Just look at the star power in this matchup. Shaq, a 54-year-old Tatanka, a 59-year-old Diamond Dallas Page, Baron Corbin! Yes, long before he would bore us to death as the acting general manager of Raw, Corbin was a promising young heel on NXT, making his main roster debut at AT&T Stadium for WrestleMania 32. Corbin last eliminated Kane to win the big gold Andre, and that put him on the fast track to a seemingly endless feud with Dolph Ziggler. It wasn't until he got drafted to SmackDown where he really got a chance to shine. He'd get the occasional WWE Championship match, won money in the bank only to waste it after getting punked out by John Cena, and held the US title all before going back to Raw where he most recently spent some time as the main authority figure and sapped our will to live. So overall, Baron Corbin's time in the company since winning the Battle Royal hasn't been bad at all. I mean, it's a lot better than the guy who won the match the next year. And now Mojo Rawley, blast the head off the apron! Mojo stole it! Oh. So here we are in Orlando, Florida, the site of WrestleMania 33. The mania with the coolest set and the largest ramp also had the distinction of having a big time bust in Mojo Rawley. The match came down to him and Jinder Mahal, which by itself was interesting. See, up to this point, the winners of the Andre Battle Royal were at least somewhat proven commodities. Cesaro, Big Show, and to a lesser extent Baron Corbin were portrayed well in their respective worlds. But here around this time, both Raleigh and Mahal were at the bottom of the pecking order. What were they doing as the final two of this match? Perhaps a good performance here would set the winner up for a big push. A scuffle outside the ring and some wasted beer led Mojo's good friend, NFL star Rob Gronkowski, to hop the railing and almost get accosted by security, only for them to realize that Gronk was part of the show. Gronkowski plastered Jinder with a shoulder tackle, allowing Mojo to eliminate the evil Canadian menace and claim the trophy for his own. And after that match, one man would be catapulted to superstardom, become an overnight success, and become the WWE Champion. That man was the runner-up, Jinder Mahal. That's right, somehow whatever shine Mojo was supposed to get from win of the Battle Royal simply bounced off of him and landed right on the modern day Maharaja, as he'd go on to have one of the most improbable rises to the top in wrestling history. Then he almost instantly went back to being a jobber after losing the belt to AJ Styles, making you wonder if it even really happened. Meanwhile, Mojo spent the next six months doing dick all, except for that time he gave some kids a tour of the backstage area he had to sell for one of them. He reunited with fellow hype bro Zack Ryder, only to betray him in a heel turn that also went nowhere. He was last seen doing some daily affirmations. Because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, FIGURED OUT! I mean, seeing Cesaro's problems for the better part of 2014 is one thing, but holy crap, at least he recovered, at least he got to win some matches now and then, at least he got to be on TV. Who the hell Mojo piss off? 
Seriously, I just feel bad for Mojo. Believe me when I say that my comments don't come from a place of malice, but rather pity. It's baffling that a guy who's been in the system for as long as he's been has done so little with his time. This guy is supposed to be one of Triple H's favorites from NXT, yet has absolutely failed to capitalize on his time in the main roster. I'd even go so far as to say that winning that match at WrestleMania may have hurt his career. Even if the overall track record for Andre winners is less than stellar, there's still an expectation of some kind of push for the winner. As bad as it's gotten, it's still better than nothing. Mojo's biggest victory sticks out like a sore thumb when you look at the rest of his work, but that's through no fault of his own. For our final chapter, we take it back to where it all began. Nolens, Louisiana, the site of WrestleMania 34, for the fifth iteration of the Andre Battle Royal. Your final three men were Woken, Matt Hardy, and two former Battle Royal winners, Baron Corbin and all-time sad sack Mojo Rawley. Thanks to an assist by the recently reincarnated Bray Wyatt, the master of House Hardy took out his opponents and claimed the trophy. Now when it comes to describing Matt's path after WrestleMania, it gets a little complicated. It's not as black and white as his hair is these days. By no means was he buried or ruined after winning the Battle Royal, but based on the booking, it's almost like him winning made no difference. By mid-April, it seemed that any and all mention of Matt having won the annual match was ancient history left to the Seven Deities, as he and Bray went full speed ahead with their run as a tag team, winning the vacant Raw tag titles against the Bar in Saudi Arabia. The two would eventually drop the belts to the B team, and by July, Hardy left the company to address his spine and hip injuries, which is totally understandable because, oh my god, did you see him walk then? I have seen peg-legged pirates with better gait. Thankfully, Matt's back and in better shape, teaming once again with his brother Jeff, which I'm sure Bray feels really good about. But for a man who already earned tons of accolades across both WWE and Impact Wrestling, him winning at WrestleMania ultimately went nowhere and was just a drop in the bucket of his career. Now that we've looked at all the past winners, I think it's time to see how they stack up against each other. If I were to rank the winners from best to worst, I'd have to place Baron Corbin at the top. Since that Battle Royal was his main roster debut, he's had practically nowhere to go but up. Despite his bland persona, Baron's accomplished plenty, so I guess it was good for something. Just behind him, I'll put Woken Matt Hardy, followed by The Big Show. Winning the trophy didn't exactly help them in their careers, but they weren't hurt by it either, unlike the bottom two. And while Cesaro's time in the sun was completely mishandled and squandered, you'd think they would have learned their lesson with Mojo Rawley, but it turns out they did it worse. So is the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal truly cursed? Well, if that were the case, there'd have to be some consistency. If you look at guys like Cesaro and Mojo Rawley and see how it harmed their careers, then yes, you could argue it is cursed. But if you look at the other three winners of the match and see what they did after the fact, it all kind of comes out even. If anything, I wouldn't say the Andre Battle Royal is cursed. It's just become a recurring part of the WrestleMania tradition that has sadly gone underdeveloped. Ultimately, what makes the history of this match type disappointing was the follow-through after that first year. Like I said, it was treated like a very big deal leading up to WrestleMania 30 after being endorsed by one of the biggest names in wrestling history, only for the winner to have a terrible year. But much like Pumax, The Thunder Mixer, Pasta Mania, and Hostamania, maybe we shouldn't believe something's great just because the Hulkster said it was. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and good luck to the poor bastard winning this year. It's going to be these two, isn't it?